God used to dwell in a house among his people. But now he has a home that's better than the first. It doesn't look like a building with a steeple. Now he's living in the people of the church. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick, he's making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones, he is building a place he can live. Brick after brick. Well, praise the Lord, church. We do give honor to God, to all of the people of God. I'd like to share a thought with you this morning. It's rather an important message that the Lord has laid on my heart. And I'd like to explore. And we will find our assignment this morning from the book of Numbers, the 20th chapter. And I'm reading today from the Revived Standard Version. Beginning at verse 1, And the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month. And the people stayed in Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation. And they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people contended with Moses and said, Would that we have died when our brethren died before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness, that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines, or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tent of meeting, and fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord said to Moses, Take the rod and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water, so that you shall bring water out of the rock for them. So you will give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hands and struck the rock with his rod twice. And water came forth abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their cattle. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me, to sanctify me in the eyes of the people of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. These are the waters of Meribeth, where the people of Israel contended with the Lord, and he showed himself holy among them. Verse 12, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me to sanctify me in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. I want to speak this morning from the subject, lines that should never be crossed. Lines that should never be crossed. Moses is my favorite character of the Bible because I identify with Moses in so many ways, not because he was a great leader and nation builder, but Moses was a real person with real flaws 
and vulnerabilities. One of the things that we know about Moses is he struggled with identity. He's a Hebrew boy that's raised Egyptian. But he's too Egyptian to be Hebrew. And for a time he was too Hebrew to be Egyptian. And so he struggles with who he is and his place in life. It is no wonder that when he confronts God, God confronts him. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I? That I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Who am I to go before Egyptians and Pharaoh? Who am I to speak to the Israelites? Here in this story, somewhat familiar story of Moses striking the rock and water coming out. And as a result of this, Moses is rebuked. It is spoken of in the Psalms. They angered him, God, at the waters of Meribeth. And it went ill with Moses on their account. For they made his spirit bitter. And he spoke words that were rash. It is recapped again in Deuteronomy. And the Lord said to Moses that very day. Ascend this mountain of the Arabid. Mount Nebo. Which is in the land of Moab. Opposite. Jericho, and view the land of Canaan, which I give the people of Israel for a possession, and die on the mountain which you ascend, and be gathered to your people as Aaron your brother died in Mount Hor, and was gathered to his people. Because you broke faith with me in the midst of the people of Israel, at the waters of Meribeth Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zin, because you did not revere me as holy in the midst of the people of Israel. For you shall see the land before you, but you shall not go there into the land which I give the people of Israel. So Moses is forbidden to go into the land of promise, the land of Canaan. I remember seeing the movie when I was a kid. And I remember distinctly asking my mother, why did God do that to Moses? What did he do so wrong? She answered me the best as she knew how. She says, because... God told him to speak to the rock, but Moses hit the rock, and therefore he was out. And I remember thinking, even back then, that's it? After all he's been through? After everything he's done? This one thing locked him out? It seemed rather extreme. It seemed kind of hard on the part of God that he could do such a thing to a man who's dedicated so much of his life and suffered so much of his life for that. On top of all this, if we read the beginning of this chapter and the people of Israel the whole congregation came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh. And Marion died there and was buried. We find out that Moses' sister just died. The woman that had been there from the beginning and has served them side by side, she's now dead in the wilderness and 
in this context, Moses goes through this episode. It was hard for me to understand. The Bible says, Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all the men that were on the face of the earth. But there was another side to Moses that is also apparent in the scriptures. Moses was a man of anger. Here again is something that I could relate to. Because while you all know me as the gentle, humble servant of God that you've come to know and love, <laughs> why are you laughing? <laughs> but I have struggled with anger. And anger has cost me in my life. Moses is a man of anger, and that may not seem like a big deal to us because we're in a culture of anger. We have anger all around us. I mean, it seems like everywhere you look, there's anger, and certainly on social media in the movies, what have you. Anger is very familiar to us. And so anger becomes somewhat normal. We're used to anger. We're not taken by anger. We're not shocked or stunned or moved by anger. It's part of life. We've come to accept it. We've come to normalize it. And so there's no wonder that even in the church, you'll find plenty of anger. The way we talk about God and share our faith comes across angry, judgmental, mean, contentious. Moses is certainly not the only person who suffered and struggled with anger, we see it in the life of Cain. From the beginning, go back to the scriptures, Genesis 4. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel brought the firstling of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must Master it. Why are you angry? We see it in the life of Jonah, which is a startling story. Because Jonah leads one of the greatest revivals in history. And yet, in the fourth chapter, when God spared the city, this change of plans greatly upset Jonah. And he became very angry. So he complained to the Lord about it. He's praying now. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That is why I ran away to Tarshish. Now stop here. I thought he repented for that in the will. But here we see he's not quite over that. What's his problem with God? I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. That was his problem with God. You're too loving. You're too compassionate, even though that's exactly what he got when he was in the well. 
Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I have predicted will not happen. Now he's suicidal. And the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? Scriptures have plenty to say about anger. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. An angry person stirs up conflict. And a hot-tempered person commits many sins. Fools vent their anger, but the wise quietly hold it back. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered person, and do not associate with one easily angered. We can do verses like this all day long. The Bible has plenty to warn against anger. But Moses is an angry man, and it was apparent all through his life and his ministry. I've always thought the scene at the burning bush was telling. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flames of fire within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. The fascination about the burning bush was not that the bush burned. Bushes burned all the time in the wilderness. It was that the bush was not consumed by the fire. Could Moses' anger burn without it consuming him? We first see Moses in action in Egypt. He views an injustice. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian. So he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. An act of murder, which only caused him to have to flee his home. Now he's not serving anyone, Egypt or the Israelites, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. We don't hear from Moses for another 40 years. Something done or said in a moment of anger can have years of consequences. How about when he is confronting Pharaoh through a series of plagues? Now it comes to a conclusion. And it's interesting what we read. Exodus 11. So Moses said, this is what the Lord says. About midnight I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die. From the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of the female slave who is at her hand mill and all the firstborn of the cattle as well. There will be a loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than there has ever been or ever will be again. But among the Israelites, not a dog will bark at any person or animal. Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. All the officials of yours will come to me, bowing themselves before me, saying, Go, you and all the people who follow you. After that, I will leave. And then notice what it says. Then Moses hot with anger, left Pharaoh. He can't even deliver a message from the Lord without burning up with anger. How about that scene at the golden calf? Here Moses returns from communing with the Lord. Israel falls into sin. And so we read, and as soon as he came near the camp, he saw the calf and the dancing. 
Moses' anger burned hot, and he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf, which they had made, and burnt it with fire, and ground it to powder, and scattered it upon the water, and made the people of Israel drink it. And Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you have brought a great sin upon them? Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people that they are set on evil. Now, I observe something very profound in this scene. Moses is angry. He throws down the tablets and destroys them, which God didn't tell him to do. But he's angry. Then we read, and he took the calf which he made and burnt it with fire. All right, this is gold. And he burns the golden calf down and ground it into powder and scattered it upon the water and made the people of Israel drink it. So get what happens here. He burns the calf. He grounds it into powder. He puts it in the water and makes the people drink. How long did something like that take? This possibly went on for hours. Moses is out of control. God didn't tell him to do any of that. But he's angry. Even the scene of Moses striking the rocks. I've always noticed in those artistic renditions, Moses striking the rock. He smites the rock. It sounds religious. It sounds majestic. Something like a magic wand. He smote the rock. But Moses is angry. Did it look like that? Or did it look like something like this? <laughs> He's angry. We could talk for a long time about anger and the dynamics of anger, but let me just give a few principles and insights in understanding anger. I've always seen anger like this, an iceberg. Everyone knows that an iceberg, as big as it may be, is only showing part of what's there underneath that iceberg is a massive amount of matter. Well, anger often tends to be that tip of the iceberg. Underneath that anger, underneath that iceberg, we find an array of emotions, frustration, hurt, confusion, disappointment, Fear, bitterness, depression, hopelessness, anxiety, helplessness, embarrassment, resentment, panic. And I'm sure we can add many other emotions. What happens is we feel a particular emotion but we express it in anger. And so we suppress the real emotion and we only display anger. This is true of everybody, but particularly of the guys. Because we would rather express embarrassment through anger. We would rather express fear being scared, and show it as anger. 
And the ironic thing is, is that while you may feel like embarrassed, hopeless, and depressed, like Jonah did, we show it in anger. If we shared certain emotions, we may actually find support and encouragement. But when we just release it in anger, we tend to get restraining orders. <laughs> anger can camouflage real emotions. Anger can distort reality. James says, dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And again, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Being angry is not a sin. Acting in anger can be. What do we do with our anger? How do we handle it? Give your anger to God. He can take it. Talk to God. Now, let's get back to Moses and let's look at what happened here. What did Moses do wrong? I would suggest to you that it's more than just he hit the rock instead of speaking to it. Clearly, Moses is a man of anger. He's expressed that, displayed that time and time again. But what happened here at this scene? Well, the people are complaining. They're angry at God. They're angry at Moses. We're in a desert. And there's no water. We're in a crisis. And they say, you did this to us. Moses is angry. Notice what the Bible says here. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tent of meeting. And fell on their faces and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The tent of meeting. What is that? Well, it's not the tabernacle. Tabernacle isn't constructed yet. The tent of meeting we read about in another portion of the scriptures, Exodus 33. Now, Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose up. Every man stood at his tent door and looked after Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the door of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the door of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship every man at his tent door. The tent of meeting was a place that Moses and Aaron would go into to hear God. It was the early version of church. And so what happens here? Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. God manifests himself to Moses and tells him what to do in this crisis. So Moses is in church worshiping, Hearing the word of God. But he leaves the church still angry. He went to church angry. Worshiped God. 
and left church the same way he went in. Isn't it a shame for people to come into the house of God, hear the word of God, and leave the same way they came in? Go on preaching hard now. It had no effect on Moses. He's still angry. He still can't let it go. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? The problem here is Moses is now associating himself With God. He's angry. So the people think. God is angry. He's judgmental. So the people see. God is judgmental. He makes himself. Identical with God. Shall we. Bring forth water for you. Well we. Ain't doing nothing. It's God who's delivering. It's God who's healing. And Moses, because he ties himself with God, now the people think that's what God is all about. When we leave here and our behavior, our conversations, our vulgarities, Our silliness takes rule in our lives. Folks look at you and think that's what God is all about. Oh, hallelujah. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me and sanctify me in the eyes of the people of Israel. You're angry, Moses, but I'm not angry. You want to judge the people. I'm trying to help the people. But now because you are falsely representing me, the people have the wrong idea about what I'm about. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In this scene, Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his rod twice. And water came forth abundantly, and the congregation drank and their cattle. This is referenced in the New Testament. Paul talks about it to the Corinthians. I want you to know, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud. And in the sea. And all ate the same supernatural food. And all drank the same supernatural drink. For they drank from the supernatural rock which followed them. And that rock was Christ. Now when Moses strikes the rock. He displays and portrays a picture about Christ. He portrays the picture of the crucifixion. Striking the rock. Judgment. That Jesus suffered. And was crucified. And out of that. Came forth living waters. It's a powerful picture. It's a poignant picture. It's a truthful picture. But that wasn't the picture that God was trying to display. Because God didn't want to do that. Moses did that because he's angry. What was God trying to display? He says, speak to the rock and water will come out of the rock. Well, water doesn't come from rocks. God says to Moses, speak my word and it will cause the rock to do what rocks can't do. 
And he's saying this the picture because if you hear the word of God and obey the word of God, it will do something in your life that you didn't think could happen. Paul says, and we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. It's the word of God that makes the difference. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commandments of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. That's why Paul was so adamant when he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First the Jew and then the Gentile. The word of God will change you in a way that nothing else can have an effect. If you have an addiction, the word of God can make the difference. If you struggle with unforgiveness, the word of God can make the difference. If you think you can't do it, the word of God will bring you to that place that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's the word of God that breaks every chain. It's the word of God that breaks the yoke. It's the word of God that will set you free and cause you to praise God, cause you to turn away from darkness, cause you to worship God, the word of God. God makes the difference. The word of God will bring the change. The word of God, the word of God will set you free. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick, he is making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and